All right. So good afternoon and welcome to SPF's special webinar on facial recognition systems in schools. My name is Amelia Vance and I'm the Director of Education Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum. As many of you know, we've been having a series this summer about privacy in general and various technologies and how they work outside of education. What are some of the privacy issues that are raised? And in this particular webinar, we're going to dig in on one particular technology or system of technology, facial recognition, and dig in a little further than we have in this series of webinars, specifically looking at why they're being adopted in schools and some of the information about why that may or may not be a good idea. I want to make sure all of you know that we have a mixed audience today, so not only SPF's usual working group, but also um, several folks who we've been working with in the school safety space, including advocacy organizations, um, as well as uh, districts, states, ed tech companies, and others. Uh, since we have a large participant list today, we are going to be doing Q&A through a Google Doc, and I'm going to announce the tiny URL for those who are joining on the phone, but the link for that Google Doc is going to be dropped in the comment box, and you can fill it in anonymously throughout, and if that's not anonymous enough for you, uh, we can make it anonymous if you want to send me an email at avance at spf.org with your question. So with that, I am now going to turn things over to uh, the first of our two speakers, Brenda Leong, uh, SPF expert in biometrics and AI. So Brenda, over to you. Thanks, Amelia. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the offer to speak today along with Evan on this very interesting, very timely, um, very getting a lot of attention in the media subject. So uh, hopefully we can provide some good information and overview and always happy to take questions either during the session or one on one afterwards for people who are interested. So I'm going to tee things up here at the start just by talking a little bit about what facial recognition technology is just how the actual uh, mechanics of the system work. Uh, and then Evan is going to go into a descriptive overview of some of the risks of facial recognition technology generally. And then I'll come back on and talk a little bit about how it uh, works in schools in particular and what some of our thoughts are about that. So as a quick uh, just level setting for folks who may or may not be familiar with different levels of facial recognition technology, um, and a lot of these resources are available on F FPF's webpage as well. There are a lot of different types of technology involved when a camera is pointing at you in a public place or in a building or wherever it might be. And they are definitely not all the same and they definitely don't all carry the same risks. What we usually think of as facial recognition technology is something that identifies us as a specific person. This is uh, usually one of two methods. One is called verification and one is called identification. Verification is a one-to-one -one matching. That's a system in which you've intentionally enrolled yourself. So perhaps it's um, access to a building that you, where you work and you're employed there and they have facial recognition systems such that you walk up, you've already been enrolled, it scans your face, it creates a template from that. And then what it does is seeks to match that to the designated file that already is associated with your name. So it's not out seeking to figure out who you are. It's just seeking to match your current template to the existing template and verify that, yes, that's um, who you say you are. One to many is the more commonly depicted version that we see in a lot of the media and in a lot of public spaces and concerns about tracking and surveillance and things where a camera would collect a version of your face, can compare that to an entire database of images to try to match and figure out who you are, where you were an unknown person to that. Um, and those are mostly the ones we're going to be talking about today. I do, however, just want to point out that there are other variations that have different aspects to them and different levels of concern uh, attached, different levels of consent that are appropriate and things like that. So the ba most basic is spatial detection, which is literally where the system is designed to see face or not face. 
And this is what your camera might use when it just puts a little yellow box around the people when you're trying to focus uh, in your viewfinder or on your screen. Or um, in stores, they might have uh, facial detection systems that are literally involved in just counting the number of people that come in um, or come through a turnstile in some sort of access point. Facial characterization takes that a step farther. It's still not involved in identifying who a particular person is, but it get, gathers a little more information about the person. Um, gender, height, some characteristics like do they wear glasses or not, uh, do you know, have long hair, short hair, and then perhaps some mood gathering uh, data as well, such as are they smiling, do they appear excited, do they appear sad, things like that. And those um, can generate some other concerns which we can discuss separately, but just important point of that is to understand that there are a lot of different applications and uses for these systems and it's important to know which one you're dealing with and which one you're talking about it when you're worried about the risks and the benefits that might be involved. Um, the basic idea of facial recognition is old but we are seeing more and more systems using this and that is in conjunction with the development of uh, artificial intelligence systems generally primarily that are based on machine learning programming and the reason for that is because as we all know over the last decade to two we have seen just exponential increases in the available computing power and in the data available to uh, operate these systems and in the computing understanding uh, advancing machine learning technology and ways to manipulate and control this data, pattern recognition, uh, natural language processing, all of the things that we are seeing today based on machine learning, which are new because we just didn't have either the technical or the data, uh, technical availability or the data available to make those happen. Next slide. So brief overview again of how the technology works. It's not at a, a as many people might suppose, it's not generally um, the case that there are actual images collected and stored. It might start with an image if you're uploading a photo, it might start with a real person if it's a scan in real time, but what that's doing is creating a template and this is based on an algorithm developed by a particular company providing the service. These are proprietary systems that do it each a little differently, which is one of the protections um, of facial recognition that makes it harder in some cases to spoof or uh, copy information from one system to another. Um, but it, it identifies a set of points on or around the face and the more points identified, the more particular and detailed the analysis can be, um, as we were talking about before with characterization versus identification. So that is then run, those points are generated in a certain way, they're run through an algorithm, and there's a long string of uh, numbers that is created, usually hashed or encrypted at that point, and that's what's actually stored in the database system, uh, so that when a new image is captured, that same process is run on it, and then you're comparing to see whether you can find a match for it, even in the designated file like verification, or out of a whole selection of possible matches that would be um, identification. Next slide. One of the things that comes up a lot when we're talking about facial recognition is the training data. So again, as I mentioned, one of the reasons that facial recognition has become uh, a system as powerful as it has in recent years is because of the amount of data available, which starts with the images that are available that this data can be collected from. As you can see here, identifying, locating the face, running those scanning and uh, turning those into algorithms. We could talk about the concerns about this for a long time, but the focus today, the main takeaway point is that the quality, diversity, and uh, quantity over time of your training data is really the underlying thing that makes or breaks a facial recognition system. So there is quality involved in the processing software storage and comparison algorithms, but it is all based on how um, comprehensive the training data was. And that's why you hear things like it works better on white men than it does on women of color, because there were many, many more white men in the database. And it's why databases that are built in China work much better on Asian faces than do most of the systems in the US. But the Chinese systems um, you know, also work much less on uh, faces more typical to North America. Next slide. I think, Evan, this is where you take over. In, 
Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. We Great. can hear you. Great. And Evan, if you want to just briefly introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Evan Selinger. I'm a professor of philosophy at the Rochester Institute of Technology and have been associated with FPF for a couple years now. Um, thanks, Amelia, and everybody for, for having me on today. So uh, by way of quick preface, uh, I've got very strong views on the topic, but my goal in this presentation isn't really to talk about my point of view. It's to capture the spirit of why the technology has become so controversial. Uh, in the slides that I'm going to show you, I want to play the role of a bit of a tour guide. So here's how I kind of think about this if you're orienting for education. Right now, facial recognition technology is controversial. Um, will it be in a few years? That's unknown. But what is known is that I think the current controversies about how the tech is used outside of schools, that's very much going to influence how parents and students and teachers and administrators and everybody else is going to view the wisdom of using it in schools. And so I think as a bottom line, if you're going to have a conversation about how to use the tech in the schools, it's likely that you should be prepared that beliefs and opinions and emotions about how the tech is used elsewhere are probably going to sort of influence what's happening there. So let's start off with the importance of faces. Uh, unlike other biometrics like fingerprints, they are the conduit between our on and offline lives, the needle that threads together our real name, our anonymous and our pseudonymous activities. So faces are incredibly important. Uh, for the most part, they're usually public facing. And to get a sense of how much emphasis is being placed on them, uh, by 2022, it's expected to become a $9.6 billion market. So if you've been tracking the news, you see that right now on the positive side for some people, there's both high hopes and a sense of determinism. So there's big goals for the tech. It can improve security and locate criminals, find missing people, deter crime, improve commercial products and educational tools, advance healthcare, and make life more efficient all around, right? Imagine no more waiting in long lines and you can pay with your face. Caught up with this enthusiasm is a bit of a sense of technological and economic determinism, a view that it's really impossible to stop the tech from advancing and being deployed further. Just to give one little uh, quote, which I think illustrates this, um, a CEO of a group that supports Nestor, a company that provides AI for the classroom, said that even though students have expressed discomfort with their instructors requiring them to use Nestor's engagement detecting system, their concern won't have any impact. He says, everybody's doing this. We can't go against the natural laws of evolution. Another metaphor you've probably heard in this is that the genie is out of the bottle and that it can't get put back in. And yet, there's a lot of criticism suggesting that those metaphors are inappropriate. So you have some people beginning to say that facial recognition in its current form presents a very new and unique challenge. And so we have this quote up here from Evan Greer, Deputy Director of Fight for the Future, where he's saying this is categorically different from any other type of surveillance that we've experienced before because it enables real-time location tracking and behavior policing of an entire population at a previously impossible scale. So even if you disagree with that and you say that no, you don't believe it is categorically different, if you want to think of it in terms of continuities and discontinuities, there does seem to be a profound amount of change occurring. Now, people look beyond the United States and they see examples of racial profiling and tracking in China and surveilling the streets of Russia for people of interest. And they express concern that maybe the way that technology is being used in authoritarian countries uh, is a bit of a cautionary tale for here. And that maybe its use here could move the US closer in that particular direction. And so if we want to begin to try to figure out why a lot of this anxiety is being stoked, it's because there really are significant gaps with the law and fairly prevalent forms of law enforcement use. So about 25% of law enforcement agencies across the country have access to facial recognition technology systems. About 50% of American adults are in a database that will be used for criminal justice purposes just because they got a driver's license. This is pretty substantial. I mean, police have long had access to databases that store important information, names, demographics, license plates, but we've never had a comprehensive database of biometrics from innocent Americans. Um, official proposals have been rejected by both Democratic and Republican parties when it comes to things like a national uh, ID biometric card. And yet it seems that the patchwork of facial recognition databases that law enforcement agencies are using 
mugshots and driver's license photos and more, they might in practice be producing something like this level of consolidated result. It seems to be a classic case of the technology advancing faster than the law, and that's because the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect what a person knowingly exposes to the public, even in her own home or office. So uh, looking into a car is not a search, even if a flashlight is used, or observing from an airplane into a fenced-in backyard doesn't count as a search. Uh, we have no reasonable expectation of privacy for our garbage or the movements of our cars in public and no reasonable expectation of privacy when it comes to people outside taking pictures of us, uh, unless they're gonna try to financially profit from it. Uh, so the bottom line is, according to the standard interpretations of the Constitution, citizens don't have privacy interests in what they voluntarily disclose in public, and so we don't have a single federal law that's controlling the use of federal uh, facial recognition technology, and nor has there been a single court case that's limiting it. In fact, from a legal perspective, non-consensual face scanning is really nothing more than visually observing what's being voluntarily disclosed to the public, a disclosure that one doesn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy on. And things are further complicated by the third party doctrine, which is that when we choose to share information with others, that can't be considered the basis of a search. This includes phone numbers, which are voluntarily conveyed to the telephone company. The government's been able to search documents given to banks and physicians without a warrant because they've been voluntarily disclosed. And in this case, the name face databases that law enforcement are using mostly come from voluntary disclosures. You voluntarily disclose this information, for example, when you sign up for a driver's license and mugshot photos, which the police take when they arrest someone, are considered public information protected by the First Amendment. Uh, other controversies have reminded us that we really can't look to protections from privacy law or the fair use exemption for copyright. So investigative reporting recently revealed that IBM took nearly 1 million photos from Flickr to train facial recognition algorithms. Uh, the photographers and their subjects were shocked. They never expected their photos to be used this way to help software improve uh, a technology that they were worried could endanger privacy and civil rights but IBM didn't violate US privacy law and the fair use exemption to copyright law might allow researchers to use these photos regardless of its license. On the commercial side and on the state side, only three state laws regulate consumer facial recognition technology. Uh, and this is problematic according to some people because without opt-in consent being required, it's arguably too easy for the commercial sector to build facial recognition databases that law enforcement can gain access to and even the three states have varying levels of stringency. Uh, Illinois is the strictest, Texas comes in second, and Washington is the least demanding. Passive consent suffices there. The right of private action is only available in Illinois, where state attorney generals would need to take action in Texas and in Washington. So given these legal uh, gaps, we've been finding a whole bunch of people saying a whole bunch of powerfully things. So Microsoft surprised a lot of people. We often think of companies as sort of fighting against regulation, but Brad Smith said that these issues go to the heart of fundamental human rights protections and was imploring the government to begin to regulate it in a more stringent level. The thing is, ever since Brad Smith's call for regulation, the metaphors describing the regulatory pathways forward, they seem pretty scary. Uh, a recent op-ed said the two choices come down to viewing facial recognition technology as either being plutonium or a radioactive isotope. So John Naughton says, we have two options for controlling this runaway technology. One is to treat it like plutonium and ban its use for civilian purposes. The other is to treat it like a radioactive isotope, which has important uses in medicine and regulate it accordingly. And it's that type of concern that's allowed something to happen in regulation that is surprising, I think most people who've been tracking privacy. We're beginning to find bans. I mean, bans are pretty much a dirty word when it comes to regulation for most people. Very few technologies are ever regulated. And digital technology, which is usually considered dual use, right, capable of being used for good and bad purposes, is traditionally considered to be outside the scope of something regulators should ever consider banning. The idea is to try to find effective and just ways to benefit and balance costs and benefits. And yet we already have uh, at the city level, San Francisco, Somerville, and Oakland banning government agents from being able to use facial recognition technology. This is a pretty big shift in our regulatory strategies uh, and in the sort of political imaginary about what's appropriate. In fact, there are more proposed bans on the horizon. 
Uh, there is a proposal to ban facial recognition from public housing. When it comes to body cams, that issue has become highly sensitive. Uh, in a recent report, uh, Jay Stanley, senior policy analyst at the ACLU, uh, notes that a smart body camera falsely telling a police officer that someone is hostile and full of anger could contribute to an unnecessary shooting. And this dovetails well with a statement that a guy by the name of Brian Brackeen, who used to be the CEO of a facial recognition technology company made when he said at that time, uh, the company was not going to uh, sell its technology to law enforcement. And if you flash forward to just, you know, earlier this summer, we now have Axon banning the use of facial recognition technology in its police uh, body cameras, at least for now. At the school level, there's even a proposal in New York to have a one-year ban in schools. And so, again, this idea that the technology shouldn't just be regulated in the traditional ways of sort of trying to maximize benefits uh, while restricting costs and harms seems to be something that's being contested in a number of spheres. Now, some of this goes back to what Brenda was talking about in her presentation, concerns about inaccuracies, errors, and biases. Uh, you might have seen a big headline grabbing thing was when Jake Snow, a technology and civil liberties attorney for the ACLU of Northern California, when he drew headlines by using Amazon's product recognition to compare pictures of members of Congress against mugshots of arrestees, his process resulted in false identifications, 28 mistakes, 11 of which were people of color, African-American and Hispanic. Uh, I actually asked Snow to give me a demonstration of how the process works and was pretty blown away. It only took four microseconds to compare one of the 535 Congress picks against the 25,000 photos in the database. Now, I had asked Snow that if he expanded the search, would he expect to see better or worse results? He said that he actually ran two tests, one with 25,000 and one with 20,000 photos, and got more false positives in the test with 25,000. Now that's interesting, it begs the question of why. The explanation is the algorithm looks for faces that are similar to a certain threshold of similarity. And this means with more faces in the database, more of them will meet the threshold. And this point might generalize, Snow said, more people that are scanned, the more errors there will be. It's worth keeping in mind that Snow's experiment used well-lit uh, pictures of members of Congress and well-lit mugshots. In the real world, this constraint isn't always followed. Hence, it's likely for now that there will be accuracy issues. Uh, more recently in April, prominent AI researchers, including experts at Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, uh, sent a letter to Amazon asking it to stop its uh, selling its technology to law enforcement agencies because it is biased against women and people of color. In fact, Amazon shareholders themselves voiced concern. Um, there were sort of two proposals that Amazon didn't want at its shareholder meetings, but the Security uh, Exchange Commission told Amazon that they had to take place. Amazon had said they had uh, served an insignificant public policy issue for the company. In the end, both proposals were shot down. But again, this speaks to sort of the, the sentiment that's out there. Beyond errors from the technology itself, there's also errors to be on the lookout for uh, with how human beings actually use it. So errors can arise in a number of ways. Uh, in a powerful report, Claire Garvey at Georgetown talked about the police using the photo of the actor Woody Harrelson when they were looking for a suspect because of a resemblance between the person they were looking for and Woody Harrelson. This is one way that facial recognition technology creep can spread, and it can work in other ways too. So if the technology, for example, is highly accurate for using DMV photos, proponents might use its reliability in this context as a pretense for using it in situations where, say, real-time video footage only allows 70% of a face to be visible, and the other 30% has to be modeled by approximation, right? So if people's eyes are closed, if part of the face is invisible, there are computational ways of filling in the gaps, and this too could raise not only error issues, but a host of evidentiary issues too. In fact, uh, if we talk about evidentiary issues, there are significant due process concerns that have been raised. So I'll just quickly talk about one example so it doesn't sound so hypothetical. This is the case of Willie Lynch, a man from Jacksonville, Florida, who was accused of purchasing drugs from undercover police officers. The officers took a picture of Lynch using a smartphone, but didn't make an ID at the scene. They submitted the photo to the Sheriff's Office Crime Analysis Unit. An analyst ran the photo through the system, got a match. Lynch is found guilty and sentenced to eight years in prison, uh, in part due to prior arrests. The case is interesting for our discussion today for a few reasons. 
The first is that the analyst didn't know how the system works, including whether the system, which gave Lynch's match a star to denote confidence, could actually give multiple stars. The Jacksonville Sheriff's Office lacked policies guiding how facial recognition should be used. The official paperwork listed a mugshot program as the basis for Lynch's identification, but didn't mention actually using facial recognition during the trial. During the trial, nobody discussed its use to make the ID, neither the prosecution nor the defense, and this precluded questioning about the accuracy of the system. And by not discussing facial recognition at trial, arguably due process issues were in play because the analyst couldn't be questioned as a witness. And by not providing Lynch with the source code, arguably the Brady rules for disclosing evidence were violated. Uh, currently right now, um, there's been a petition for the Florida State Supreme Court case to hear the issue, focusing in part on the failure of the lower courts to consider how facial recognition was used to produce evidence that should have been turned over to the defense. Another cause for concern is lack of transparency. Uh, investigative reporting has turned up a number of surprising ways that the technology has been used, uh, but it's been argued this is only the tip of the iceberg. Um, one recent uh, issue with transparency that drew headlines was when it was revealed that immigration and customs enforcement agents were using facial recognition technology in a few states to run searches on undocumented workers who had legally obtained driver's licenses and weren't aware that getting a license could lead them to being searched. According to the reporting, targeted individuals included those suspected of overstaying their visas, giving false information and stealing, but also extended to witnesses, victims, and other innocent individuals who are not charged or suspected of criminal activity. Facial recognition technology is also drawing controversy because as uh, Brenda articulated, it's not just used for purposes of identification and verification, but also for characterization. And so there are already people who are claiming that, for example, facial recognition technology can do things like identifying the basis of facial features, uh, somebody's sexuality, whether somebody is gay or straight. And so if we want to summarize all of these, and again, my, my goal here really was just to provide a kind of uh, a tour into some of the concerns that I think will be background material when people are talking about whether or not to use facial recognition technology in the schools. I think it comes down to this. We have concerns about errors and biased results, about inadequate regulation, about disparate harms for vulnerable populations, about due process harms, there's concerns about chilling effects, which would probably hold even more if the technology were error free, about whether people would feel comfortable uh, free associating, uh, engaging in free speech at things like rallies and protests, or uh, engaging in free movement and being able to go, for example, to controversial houses of worship. There's concerns about over policing and about policing uh, for minor infractions being used as a pretext to cover over more invasive motives. In the last slide where I talked about uh, facial characterization, there were concerns about what's uh, referred to in the literature as digital epidermalization. So one component of this is the coded gaze, right? The idea that an algorithm is making the determination about what type of a person you are or what your proclivities are or who you are and what you'll be expected to do in the future. Some of this is underwritten by junk science. So you've probably heard the phrase digital phrenology. Some of it may not be, but it doesn't matter. The, the coded gaze is a problem in and of itself, whether or not applied junk science is being used. Uh, the easier it is to identify who we are with minimal transaction costs uh, represents an erosion of obscurity on a large scale. Uh, this brings us back to Evan Greer's comment, potentially the likes of which we haven't seen before. And obviously with uh, all data, Uh, there are security vulnerabilities. And so as my last slide, I just want to read a quick quote from an ACLU uh, post. Here's what happens when we allow facial recognition technology into our schools. Normalizing mechanisms of surveillance and control catalyzes the criminalization of the school environment and could make school hallways feel more like jails. It facilitates the tracking of everyone's movements and social interactions and reinforces the school to prison pipeline. So it's that level of big picture thinking, which might not always take place when we're talking about um, how educational uh, environments should use technologies that are exactly the types of concerns that I would expect to occur uh, when local districts are debating the issues for exactly the reasons that I just presented. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Evan, really appreciate it.
We're going to transition now back to Brenda. We'll just give it a minute so Brenda can switch over to her slide. All right. Are you seeing? Not yet. Yeah, I'm selecting now. All right. There. Are you there seeing? There we go. Oh, okay. Yes. So I do want to just right up front, as uh, this slide already reflects, I'm going to be talking in detail about some school shootings, and I want to provide a warning on that so that if there are people that are um, uncomfortable or not wanting to readdress some of those issues right now, um, that you might want to uh, drop out for a little bit or view the rest of this later uh, at a different time. Um, so I think that Evan has provided a great overview of the general sort of societal concerns and risks about facial recognition technology. And so now the reason that we're going to talk about it is why you would use it in a school. What benefit does it provide? What concerns are there? And things like that. Um, <clears throat> technology generally is used to do something we couldn't do before or to do something better than we could do it otherwise. And that's just sort of the nature of technological process, both mechanical and electrical and digital and so forth throughout history from <clears throat> washing machines all the way to natural language processing. So in this case, I think that that analysis or that framing helps us to understand why facial recognition may not be the best solution in schools. Because if we start with what is the problem being solved, really the underlying answer is addressing our fears of school shooters and other security issues uh, in and around schools, um, but primarily at an emotional level, the very real threat in this country of um, armed people in public places, including schools. So in this case, what this allows us to do is to feel that we are exerting uh, control over a situation where we otherwise feel powerless. This is a context for the most vulnerable among us, which is our children, who are we are, you know, designed to most protect and we feel that they are threatened and we want to take steps to protect them. So, sorry, it's not advancing my slide there for a minute. Um, so obviously there are other things that the technology does and I want to be clear that those are um, very real services that it can provide. The companies that design and provide these systems will offer a number of advantages to a school that they feel that these services will provide, including um, more administrative efficiency, speed of access into or out of the school, accuracy of some of the um, tracking of school employees, both administrators and faculty, and location tracking um, of students and attendance data of students if the students are included in the database, which is one of the big ifs of how these systems might be used, and tracking volunteers who work at the school regularly, making them feel uh, more included as part of the community by having them enrolled in the database after some sort of screening or approval process, and different schools handle that differently now. So the question is, do these systems actually provide these benefits in a more efficient way that we can't get any other way, that we either already aren't doing or can't get in some other way with other technologies, either for lower actual costs, like literal monetary value, or at least with less privacy risk. So one of the schools that um, we talked to or, or, or heard quotes from at one point was a school that you know emphasized a sense of community, wanting to create a database of all of the people who were part of the school system, some of whom work there full time every day, some of whom come in on certain days, like a music teacher or a special ed teacher, um, parent volunteers, and to you know, have them enrolled in the database, it would, it would be an easy and fast way into the schools, opposing to have to stop and ring the bell and be admitted. Um, and they really valued this sense of community. One of the examples they gave, however, was that they were gonna include the UPS guy who comes in every day to drop off mail and packages in that database. And I thought, I can't think of anything that's a worse idea uh, as an example of why you wouldn't want to do this. Because that's a person they have no insight into their background or um, character or anything else. And I am absolutely not maligning UPS guys here, just saying that, that the school has no control or authority over that. And so to just sort of routinely add people into your database because they're someone that the school interacts with regularly without some sort of background screening process or security verification process is only going to weaken the benefit that the system provides because for example if the UPS guy leaves that job and moves away but he's still in the system um, and then comes back later and still has access to the school 
uh, which he doesn't need to have. The other context that we need to put this in is what is the scale of the actual threat that we're addressing here? As absolutely terrifying as I find the idea of school shootings, I'm a parent, I have children in school, I absolutely can relate to every fear that is engaged on that. What is the statistical reality of, of this school, of this possibility? And it is in fact very, very low. It does not make any one of these occurrences less tragic or less awful or uh, decrease our desire to prevent them in any way, but it does need to be addressed in the system of uh, where we put our resources and how we prioritize our security measures in terms of what threats are we actually addressing, because we're going to talk in a minute about even taking this action, does it actually solve this problem or not. Um, in school shootings, and again, I apologize for re-addressing re all of these uh, some of the more famous ones, there have certainly been many, many others uh, through the years between and among these, uh, but these are the ones most people are familiar with. Um, in the Columbine shooting, the uh, shooters were all enrolled students, so they, even if students were in the database, which most best practices agree they should not be, they would not have been prevented from entering the school. Same with the Virginia Tech school uh, shooting. The Sandy Hook shooting, the young man came and shot his way through locked front doors of a system that had just recently been upgraded to include better facility security, locked doors, controlled access. Um, but, you know, somebody with a, a semi-automatic weapon who's determined to get through there is probably going to find a way through. And not only would facial recognition not have necessarily identified him, even had he been in the system, um, which is, you know, arguable, uh, but the uh, scope and pace of his actions once he was there would have prevented any ability to respond that facial recognition system that identified him would not have given faculty or staff any advent advantage in being able to respond more quickly or do anything uh, more directly. Uh, in the Parkland shooting, similarly, it was an expelled student, so arguably he might have been in the database of people to uh, prevent entrance, but in fact, um, that school has multiple buildings as part of its high school facility, and he came in through an unlocked stairwell door. So basic security procedures of keeping facilities locked uh, need to be the first line of defense and, and part of the basic operations that no amount of technology, facial recognition or any other, is successfully going to combat. The other problem with this is this is not the only kind of violence in schools. It doesn't address the other problems that schools may be having with either community or student actions on their campuses. And there is very likely going to be a mismatch of schools in terms of their likelihood to have violence related problems to those with the resources to have these systems. For example, um, black youths are 16% of the school population, but experience school shootings at almost twice that rate of 34% uh, and are least likely to have advanced technology systems for access. So what are some of the direct risks of these systems in terms of their cost? They literally cost a lot of money. And most of the examples of schools that have implemented these systems have raised money in special bonds or other um, budget line items, ways of getting additional funding, because it is always up in the millions of dollars. And I think that there's probably no one who doesn't agree that there are many things that we could give to the school systems in this country for those amounts of money that might have more direct and positive impact on uh, both security and safety and uh, other educational goals for that. There are also long-term maintenance costs. These are very complex systems. They take someone trained to operate and run them and they take constant upgrade like any security system. They have to be patched or any computer system, they have to be patched have um, routine upgrades, have trained people who understand how to do um, the enrollment into the database, uh, taking people out, adding people in, maintaining the system itself, and um, securing the data that is held there at the school, since that um, either at the school or through however the vendor is providing it is now creating a database of information that also has to be protected. Um, in addition, there are the privacy and security risks generally, which Evan, I think, already covered very well. Uh, if there's not an opt-out option for these systems in these contexts, then we have other privacy concerns about 
autonomy and chilling effects and things like that. And then, as I mentioned, there's just the security of the data itself. Some of the indirect concerns are listed here. Mission creep particularly applies to the idea of whether the students themselves are in the um, database or not, because if they are not, which is a standard best practice, and most of the companies that are selling these uh, systems to schools agree not to put the students in, but it's hard to believe that over time that wouldn't be seen as a desirable use once the system is in place. It's expensive, it's there, it has functionality to do additional things that um, perceive as benefits, and so there's going to be a real uh, temptation to try to use it for some of those systems. Uh, once that happens, or even necess not necessarily when that happens, um, there are other data collection implications of having these systems in place, including additional data that contributes to student profiling, which is already a very big concern in the uh, uh, education and student privacy world, the chilling effects that we've already talked about, and potentially even real-time streaming, which is a version of facial recognition where the collection is happening and being observed as, it's, as students are moving in and out of either access points um, or other locations and um, can be used to monitor behavior in that way. Um, there are, I think, perfectly uh, legitimate uses of biometrics in schools. And uh, unlike Evan, I am also believe that there are uh, perfectly legitimate uses of facial recognition technology, but not in schools. And these are some of the ways that biometrics can be implemented, some of the services that they can provide without many of the same risks. They don't have to be used. They're not necessarily better than some of the other ways. But it was just an example to sort of say that it's not categorical, that there is necessarily no type of biometric um, net relevant to be used in schools. And I understand that RFID cards are not biometrics, but they are something that's frequently used as a, a similar tracking alternative. So school safety is a complex subject. It is something that obviously should be um, every school system, every parent, and every community member's priority to provide a safe place for children to go and learn effectively. And there are a lot of pieces to that that need to be prioritized and used. Um, in our opinion, facial recognition technology does not enhance that and in fact poses many risks for um, students who operate in that environment. So last slide is just for people who are looking some additional information or resources. Uh, COSIN had put out a briefing on this in January, which is uh, available on their members services page um, on facial recognition technology as well. And that is all I have. And I think that uh, Amelia, we can turn it over for questions now. Absolutely, and thank you so much, uh, both Evan and Brenda, for your presentation. Uh, we are now uh, going to go ahead and take the questions that are listed uh, in the Google Doc. Uh, for those who are on the phone, that Google Doc is tinyurl.com slash school, that's plural, school, Facial Recognition 08-2019. Again, that is tinyurl.com slash school, facial recognition 08-2019. And thank you to those who have already started putting questions in the Google Doc. So first and foremost, to either Brenda or Evan, how can, I, I'm going to assume districts, our uh, schools respond to the concerns of parents who believe that schools aren't doing enough. You want to take that, Brenda? Uh, sure. So um, there, we didn't really have time today to go into the variety of security measures that are available, but obviously access controls to schools is not new. Um, as I mentioned, in many cases, just doing the basics of security that are already well understood, like locking doors, controlling the campus, controlling access to either larger perimeter of grounds or into the buildings themselves um, already exist. There are ways to screen people in advance and run security or background checks on volunteers as well as other members of the school community. Um, schools right now have a hard enough time keeping up with their employee database such that even if they have like a card or some other access for those faculty members that trans, um, you know, work between schools during the day, uh, being able to get in and out as they need to 
um, can be challenging. And so keeping up the facial recognition databases is no easier and potentially harder than some of those systems. So there are a lot of uh, resources in place to have good security. There are obviously places in the world that have a really good security for physical access to buildings and grounds. We don't want our schools to feel like prisons nor like you know, uh, defense establishments or anything, but we do want to make sure that our children are safe. And I think that there are a lot of things out there that parents, PTAs, uh, faculty, and school boards can all engage with to, to do that effectively. Great. Anything to add before we go to the next question, Evan? No, I think that was fantastic. Thanks, Amy. Perfect. And if you have other questions um, on other measures going on, the education team at SPS has obviously been doing a ton of work on this, and we're happy uh, to discuss it further. Uh, so next question, while there have been some high profile bans on facial recognition, there's uh, also been a flurry of activity to make schools safer. Do you think it is more likely that states and localities will ban the use of facial recognition? Or is it more likely that states will require or incentivize it? I guess I'll just chime in quickly. I mean, you know, it depends at the moment in time that you look into your crystal ball. So if you look at this about a year ago when Brad Smith first started talking about the importance of enhancing regulation, at that time, it seemed that the calls for uh, any kind of a ban, including short-term moratoria, I think most in the privacy community were expressing real serious doubt. They thought it was a kind of pie in the sky idea, that it was overly extreme and was sort of out of step with the way that regulation actually occurs. So the fact that we already have momentum within a year where we have three years, th three cities that have already committed to bans, in and of itself, that might not be a striking number. But if you compare it to the, the real level of incredulity that none of this would ever be possible, it's a staggering result. So, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't make a prediction about what's going to happen going forward. These things, you know, tend to be sort of dynamic. It depends what happens in response. But I will say the political imagination has really been catalyzed by this. I mean, people are thinking about Again, whether it's a short-term moratoria or a longer-term ban, they're thinking about extreme forms of regulation that really have been outside the scope. Whether this will catch fire or not, I, again, I'm not sure, but that we've seen this much momentum, to me, is, is incredibly striking. I will just add really quickly that by asking a question that says the states, we sort of overlook the fact that many states are very different from many other states. And while Evan's point is well taken, that in certain communities or certain areas, there's a large momentum for the idea that maybe some of these restrictions and regulations can happen uh, to a level that wasn't necessarily thought reasonable or, or likely a year or two ago. Uh, I think there are also places that are going to have a very different mindset and will go more down the other path, not necessarily mandating them, but certainly allowing or encouraging and potentially incentivizing them in some form or fashion, um, since we've certainly seen a variety of different approaches already in how schools approach this. Thanks, and I'll just add to that, as many of you know, uh, a few years ago, Florida passed one of the first student privacy laws back in 2014, and they had actually banned uh, most biometric collections of information, even at the local level. Other states that had done this just banned sharing biometric information um, uh, with state or federal authorities. Um, and we have heard some rumors that that may be rolled back due to school safety concerns. So um, it is at least being discussed in that state, but I think a lot of that is because they banned it at the local level in the first place. Um, so just throwing that out there. Um, I wanna come back to a, a use case that we saw about a year ago well, I guess a year and a half ago, where you had um, a, a, at least it appeared to be high quality facial recognition technology, very low error rate, um, that was being provided free to schools, did not involve any purchases of um, uh, new hardware, was just a software that overlaid. And so I was wondering if both of you can talk a little bit about if the software is accurate, 
And if it is free, though there's obviously a question of down the road, is it going to continue to be free? What are the harms in that particular case? Can I go first, Brenda? And then Absolutely, you, go for it. And then you can correct whatever overstatements I'm about to make. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to say something that uh, I think will resonate with some people listening and other people will say is, is overblown. So take, take this as you will. But I would say one of the potential harms in this instance, and it's, it's hard to quantify and it's hard to be precise about, nevertheless, I think it is a real challenge, is the, is the problem of normalization. And so if we go back to the very beginning of Brenda's presentation, Brenda, just like in the FPF document, does a really amazing job of analytically differentiating different types and different uses of the technology. So obviously facial characterization is a very different use of it than say identification and verification. I think the problem is in practice, when people are living their lives and doing their things, these type of refined analytic distinctions aren't necessarily how people think about technology. And so one of the concerns I would have is that even when it comes to uses of the technology that don't appear to present any apparent risk, the more accustomed people in society become to using facial recognition technology, I think arguably you can make the case that the threshold for being able to have critical conversations about the more obvious and difficult cases I think it becomes a bit harder. So you could argue that the key, the key problem of normalization is that it becomes politics through the back door, which is to say that certain forms of innocuous uh, behavior themselves incentivize a level of comfortability. And even if it's not about sort of like politically contentious uses of this, uh, I do think in the aggregate, all things considered, it can implicate how people come to have those kinds of conversations. I'll also just throw in on a practical level that, you know, free is never free. If somebody gives you a car for free, that's great because it saves you, you know, whatever the tens of thousands of dollars are that you would have had to pay for it, but you still have to put gas in it and change the oil and maintain it and buy new tires and insure it and you know over time it will require routine upgrades and maintenance and service and um certainly that initial benefit is is huge and i'm not going on record here as saying i wouldn't take a free car um but i just want to point out that that there nobody is i think offering everything covered um forever this is a way to prove value to their system so that they can sell more of them in other places um, and or sell the service over time that they provide for training or upgrade or data management or um, data storage and security and all those kinds of things. So no such thing as a free lunch, not even in school? Apparently not. Bad joke, guys, bad joke. All right. Um, so if a school decides to implement facial recognition technology in schools, such as uh, Lockport, New York has been the one the most in the news, what are the chances that it will become a slippery slope, causing other schools to purchase, install, or implement facial recognition technology? Uh, I'll, I'll quickly take that. Uh, I would say very high. <laughs> so I, I, I say two very quick things. I mean, I, I, I don't mean to pile on that particular example, but I, I do think the case of Lockport at least suggests there is a problem of you know the sunk cost fallacy, which is once a massive amount of investment gets pumped into this, and people's reputations and professional careers are associated with the decision to make that investment, it's pretty hard to back out. So one of the ways that a slippery slope gets greased, right? We're, we're sort of taught in baby logic class that slippery slopes are fallacious arguments. I don't think that's always true. Some are, some aren't. And the ones that aren't can pretty clearly specify what, would, what causal factors would move the slope along. So heavy investment, makes it hard to turn back. And that's what happens when infrastructure grows. So one way that the slippery slope could go from, from there to elsewhere is, despite the kinds of conversations that we've had today, if the optics turns out to be a perception that schools who aren't doing this aren't doing enough uh, to protect their kids, that might be one way in which uh, a, a kind of the, the mechanism of fear moves the slope further. Great. Anything to add, Brenda? Yep, I think that covers it. 
So what do you know about how facial recognition or emotion detection is being used to monitor students and or teachers? Is this being sold or implemented? That's you, Brenda. I'm sorry, I lost a little bit of that question. I, monitor teachers, is this what? Is this being sold or implemented? My short answer is yes, yes it is, and I can give you <laughs> a bunch of news articles, which are included in the Google Doc that I shared. But Brenda, what do you have to add? You, you've heard more pitches from uh, Facial Rack and Biometrics and others um, than I have for sure. Yeah, so obviously most of our conversation today is focused on, on the safety of the students. Uh, the safety of the faculty and um, staff is clearly as high a concern on, most, on the part of most schools, and that is and going to be included in any rationale. But yes, as soon as you start to focus on a facial recognition system that is only covering a database of employees, now you're in a workplace facial recognition environment, which is apart from the students and the school specifics, um, already a thing that is very disputed and at issue in many contexts, many employment cases uh, all over the place. And there are a number of cases in Illinois right now um, on the based on that biometrics law that Evan was talking about about how intrusive employees can or employers can be with biometric systems including facial recognition and how that impacts employees generally so absolutely for teachers um, location tracking behavioral tracking uh, logging in their time their work time their online time their presence in different places um, it gets into a very, uh, you know, that technology, that's not the only technology that can track that, but obviously those are some of the issues that come up with if you're using a facial recognition system. And that's kind of that mission creep of if it's not all about security, but now we're starting to use it for other purposes, at least on faculty and staff, if not on students. Great. Well, we are just about at time, but I want to ask, an important question, uh, just very quickly, if a school does decide to adopt facial recognition technology, since I know a lot of the folks uh, that are logged in today, maybe you know in the IT office or a council's office and may not be looped into the discussions that a safety office or others may have, what are the privacy protections that they can push for in order to attempt to mitigate some of these privacy harms? You've probably told more about this than I have, Brenda. <laughs> um, well, I would say that, you know, if it's being bought essentially primarily for security purposes, then it should be used primarily for security purposes. And those kinds of mission creep we were just talking about should be by policy, carefully prevented um, or not done. Students should not be enrolled. Um, there should be an opt out option for faculty and staff. They should be allowed to choose the greater inconvenience of pressing a buzzer or carrying a card or using a key to get in and out of the school uh, if they choose. Um, and the data collection, storage, and um, uh, retention should all be under good privacy normal practices, which is to say that um, it should be clear to the people who are engaged with the system what's being collected, how it's being used, how long it's being kept, uh, and the school should be deleting it once it's no longer needed in a very transparent way, just like hopefully they do with many other categories of data. Fantastic. Anything to add, Evan? I like it. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, one other question that does not require a response from you guys was, uh, how can people follow up with speakers? So I've put back up this slide with the contact information of Evan and Brenda. You can also reach out to me at avance at fpf.org. Uh, the education privacy team at FPF is doing a significant amount of work on school safety and privacy, some of which is out already, uh, a whole bunch of which is not out that we're circulating for comment, including toolkits on uh, things like uh, social media monitoring and privacy and uh, threat assessments and privacy and just trying to make it a little easier for districts to get some actionable solutions and understanding of what the privacy issues are. So feel free to reach out, especially if you want to read one of these things and give us some comments. Um, but other than that, I want to thank our speakers. I want to thank everyone uh, who logged in today. Really appreciate it. We're going to put this webinar up online so you can share it with your colleagues and others. 
and thanks again for joining today.